Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, this is electric vehicle service equipment for home inspectors. And I am Bryce Nesbitt, um, Internachi CPI, February 2024. And I am a property inspector um, in working in the Berkeley, Oakland, Albany, and Emeryville, California area. Uh, I have some specific niches that I work in, in particular, unpermitted units and rent control. Uh, we're in a rent control jurisdiction, and that makes uh, unpermitted units particularly serious because of the rent control implications. I am a reformed electrical engineer and kind of all around geek. Um, and electrical engineers are not electricians, nor are they necessarily inspectors. Uh, so I only say that for background. Uh, here I'm going to be speaking as an inspector to inspectors. Okay, just some background. Uh, electric vehicle sales, it's 25% of new car sales in California as of this year, and 90% of new car sales in Norway. But whether you care about that or not, if the property you're inspecting has an EV charger, I think the subject demands 100% of your attention. And if you see an EV charger, you're going to have to decide what to do. And this webinar is meant to help uh, help you decide if you're going to inspect that or disclaim it, uh, what you're going to inspect. I promised uh, pictures of melted outlets, and here's your first one right up front so no one gets disappointed. Uh, this is, if you look carefully, um, if anyone wants to chat to make sure that you can see this uh, nice and Nice and well, I can zoom it if you need. Uh, but this is a melted NEMA 1450R EV charger outlet. You can see all of the plastic on the plug that's being removed. And this is, in fact, the Federal Pacific of electrical outlets. This is the common Home Depot uh, 50 amp outlet uh, made by Leviton. And it is widely regarded as something that will melt under actual load. And in general, for these plugs, if you're coming in and inspecting one, you might be tempted to unplug it. I don't know if you do this with dryers, if you've got a dryer or a stove, if you ever unplug it, but I encourage you not to do that. Uh, these connectors, even the good ones, have a limited number of cycle lives. And each time you remove it and plug it in, it might get a little bit looser. And loose means electrical resistance, which means heat. And when we're talking about electrical uh, for EV charging, it's a lot of power. So think about 14 microwave ovens all plugged in to the same circuit. That's your EV charger. And that's why inspection is needed. That's why if this is um, not electrical 101 for electricians, but electrical 102. It's a little more advanced topic in order to get uh, an EV charger set up at high power and working well in a way that's going to be safe no matter what EV, no matter the temperature outside and things like that. So, important question here, should I even inspect it? Under the InterNACHI standards of practice, you could disclaim the EV charger and say that you didn't inspect it. And that would be valid and I'd understand why someone would do that, uh, particularly if they're not familiar with the equipment. But I feel that it's harder to argue that the wiring and breakers are excluded. So we normally open up electrical panels, at least I think most of us do, and look for burnt wiring and things like that. And the EV charger is pretty much the same thing. Basically, it's like a really big dryer. And you might exclude the dryer itself, but you'd have a hard time saying that the wiring, the house wiring, uh, leading up to the charger is something that you want to exclude. Either way, write very, very clearly. Um, uh, you need to, in your reports, if you've got an EV charger that's going to go and stay with the property, you need to be clear what you did inspect and what you didn't inspect. That's my view. So uh, take a break at the moment if anyone wants to raise their hand and have any questions so far. And, uh, and if not, then I'll... Uh, uh, plow along with the presentation. You can chat your questions, uh, raise your hand, or I can move on.
Okay then, moving on here. So EVSC, first of all, it's a kind of funny term. It stands for electric vehicle service equipment. Uh, people regularly call them chargers, but in fact, they're not chargers. They are simply a big honking power relay. So if you can see my, uh, uh, my pointer here, you've got your breaker in the house and the wiring inside the house. Somehow it gets to the EVSC, maybe through a plug, maybe direct wired. And over on the vehicle end, that vehicle power connector that plugs in just has line one, line two, ground, and two control signals. When the computer inside the EVSC decides that the circuit is safe, it's going to do a GFCI check, it's going to set a current limit, it's going to do a couple of little things. All it does is close this relay here. And house power goes straight to the EV. It's not processed, it's not changed in voltage, nothing is changing about that. It's simply a switch. And in fact, if you wanted to cheat and violate every safety standard known to mankind, you could make your own EVSC using just a switch. That means that it's not really a charger. Uh, the charger and all of the complicated battery electronics exists inside the car. So the cars are all set up in the United States to accept 120 volts. Uh, that's called level one charging or some version of 240 volts. That's called level two charging. It's important if you're looking at an EVSE and saying, oh, well, I could just stick a multimeter into those pins and measure if the voltage is right. No, you can't. Because an EVSE is off until it detects a car. We have a line called Control Pilot, or CP, and the EVSE sends out a message that says how much current it's willing to supply. And the car sends a message back saying that there's a car. And only when everything lines up does that relay actually close? Um, there's one more signal on the car. It's called proximity pilot. And it has to do with uh, the little button when you try to remove the thing. Uh, it likes to shut off the electricity before the electrical connection is removed. And that's to avoid sparking. So if we have a tremendous amount of energy going into a car and we immediately remove it, that can create a little small spark. And that's not a big safety problem, but it can create pitting or it can um, uh, damage the pins over time. So proximity pilot is used to shut off the power. And that's what an EVSE is. And um, having this model in your mind as you're inspecting it, I think will help you. Um, know that it's not doing much other than collecting earth, connecting the house power to the car. So what does one actually look like? Um, if you've never seen one, uh, this is about the simplest uh, EVSE that's possible. This might have come inside the trunk of a new car. Uh, it's got the plug that goes into the car. This is a J1772 plug. The EVSE here, which is that big relay. And in this case, just a regular outlet plug that you could plug into any outlet. And again, as inspectors, I would say you're going to be interested in where that thing is plugging into. If you see a piece of equipment like this in somebody's garage, go ahead and, in this case, unplug it, but definitely look at that outlet. Is it discolored? Does it show signs of heat stress? Um, what breaker is feeding it? What circuit is it on? Just look for problems because EVs uh, treat electrical systems loud and hard. So there are uh, two main types of chargers as well. So you've got the 120 volt chargers and the 240 volt chargers, but you also have smart versus dumb. Uh, this is a dumb charger that's designed in Canada. It's extremely rugged and uh, ready for, for very harsh conditions. Uh, all of its electronics inside are, are covered for longevity. Um, What's happening in the EV world is that nobody can quite choose where the smarts are supposed to be. So for reasons that I'll get into a little later in the presentation, you often want to control what time you're charging the car to optimize time of use rates or for solar energy or what it may be. And most vehicles can do that timing thing. Most 
Smart EVSEs can do that. There are smart outlets that can turn EVSEs on and off. The power company wants to get involved, turning off uh, people's electric car charging if, uh, if too many people have turned on their air conditioner. And uh, there's even smart breakers that can do that. And this is something that nobody has really worked out. This topic, however, isn't so important to your inspection, uh, but it can be important if you're trying to plug in a charger and get it to actually work, because it may be on a timer or a schedule and it won't work. And you're saying, oh, this thing is broken, but really it's just because it's turned off at the time of day that you happen to be at the property. Okay, barreling right along. Um, we'll uh, go back to school here for a moment and read the NEC. So we have section 625.42, electrical vehicle charging loads shall be considered to be continuous loads for the purpose of this article. And it defines a continuous load as a load where the maximum current is expected to continue for three hours or more. And uh, anyone wants to put in the chat, uh, we'll take the first person who gets this as to uh, why or what the implication of this is. And uh, the 80% rule here says that your breaker doesn't match your charger speed. So if you've got a 16 amp charger, you're gonna be needing to supply that with a 20 amp breaker. Same for a 40 amp charger. A 40 amp charger needs a 50 amp breaker. And this is absolutely something that you can check uh, in your inspections and probably should. So we're used to as, as inspectors, uh, noting errors in breaker sizes and wire gauges. And if keeping this basic NEC rule in mind and how EV chargers work, this would be your chart. So a 50 amp breaker is going to be matched to a 40 amp EVSE. That's the maximum that the car will be allowed to pull. It'll need number six Romex or number eight THHN. And the reason for that difference is um, a, a heat. The THHN is, is rated for more heat. And the ground is number 10 will give you roughly 25 miles per hour of charging. Hey, Bryce, uh, real quick, I'm not sure if you addressed this, but Jim was asking what percentage, what percentage are Home Depot 50A outlets? So hopefully less and less as they count, as they start to melt. The, uh, the issue, and I'm gonna get to this, is that you may have that Home Depot output outlet and it may work fine for you for years because your EV can't draw as much current as your EVSE will allow. And then your friend comes over and they've got a Ford F-150 and they plug in and your circuit melts. So what percentage are they? Um, hard to tell, uh, but because when you, because online things, uh, you can never tell because people have posted widely showing pictures of this outlet failing. And this outlet, the, the Leviton, what I'm calling the Federal Pacific of outlets, is way lighter than the Hubble of the equivalent. It, it's just clearly cheaply made. And I wouldn't recommend using it at all. And I do recommend watching out for it in your inspections. Again, it may not melt in a particular instance because you haven't yet presented it with the maximum load. If you have a dryer and a dryer outlet and it's been in the house for 10 years and it seems to be in good shape, you know, you're probably fine, but then somebody buys a different dryer that uses more. And that would be the equivalent here, except in this case, it's the car that is determining how much gets pulled out. Hopefully that answered the question. And I'm happy to take questions as we go along. So there may or may not be a label. And this is a complex, this is a complexity. So if you see a 48 amp wall box charger and it says 48 amps on the outside, it may or may not actually be 48 amps. Most of the EVSEs uh, that go for higher amperages also have a way to dial them down. So inside the box, 
as a little current selector, um, I believe that on this particular model, two is 30 amps and one is 20 amps. And the electrician can put less wire, smaller breaker, put this high power charger in and then turn it down to match the wire and the breaker. And they are supposed to at that point write on the label outside of it that they have done so. And I have yet to see that in the field. Um, so this is another issue, another complexity here of, of correctly inspecting EV chargers. So the max may not be the max. So this piece of EVSE equipment sets the maximum signal, maximum current via the pilot signal. So if I had that wall box, that 48 amp wall box, and the electrician at time of install turned it down to be a 20 amp maximum, then that wall box would advertise to the car that the most you're allowed to draw is 20 amps. The car would comply and pull no more than 20 amps. It is welcome to pull less than that, however. And that brings up another uh, difficulty with trying to actually test these circuits to the maximum. You have to get a car that is willing to um, ask for as much electricity as you want to test for. So, if you're actually going to uh, use a thermal camera or go in and uh, test connections, then you need to get an EVSC that is partially charged, an EV that is. So electric vehicles, when the battery is empty, that's when they can take the maximum amount of current. And as they get close to full, they start to drop off on the amount of current that they pull. And when the temperature is too high or too low, they may also uh, lower their charging volume. And um, repeating here, but don't assume that because it works, it's right. So if your EV charging circuit looks to be perfectly fine now, it hasn't really been tested until it's been given a Ford F-150 or something that can really pull a lot of current. However, the calculations are nice and clear. If the breaker's the right size, the wire's the right size, and the screws are torqued down correctly, then it's going to work. There's all sorts of other ways of hooking it up. For example, you may see this device. Um, anyone wants to play the home game, you can chat what you think this is, uh, and then I'll pop into what it really is. But this is a dryer sharing device. So you plug the plug on the left, into your dryer outlet, you plug the dryer and your EV into this device and it automatically switches between the two. And this device is completely legitimate. It's UL certified, um, completely safe. Again, you as an inspector would probably be looking at each of these outlets and looking for evidence of heat stress uh, or any of these connectors melting or do they seem to be fine. But not all devices are legitimate and UL certified. For example, there's this lovely thing which you can buy on Amazon. And that has a NEMA 1450 outlet, 240 volts, um, and is probably paired with a 50 amp breaker. And on the left, it allows you to plug in up to four regular household outlets. This isn't safe at all. Uh, if anything goes wrong, with any of those pieces of plugged in equipment, they'll melt and catch fire because the breaker at 50 amps will never detect that. So um, another thing you can consider doing is looking and noting if there are UL certification stamps on the equipment, uh, if it appears to be from a legitimate brand. This is a really tough one because Amazon and other online retailers uh, these days are selling a lot of imported EVSE equipment that's not actually certified, or worse yet, it has fake certification stamps. But at least stuff like this that you could see in somebody's garage uh, is clearly illegitimate and has no purpose and well, has a purpose, but it really shouldn't exist. This would be uh, a hazard. Uh, again, you could try to disclaim this one by saying that it's not part of the house. Uh, it's plugged in equipment and that would le be legitimate. Uh, but uh, maybe you want to note it if you see something like this. So 
that was the background on what's special about electric vehicle charging. In general, when you come and look at a house, you are going to be inspecting the electrical system, and the EV system is really no different. The foundations of inspecting for EVs is just a good basic electrical inspection. NACHI has a course on that, how to perform residential electrical inspections. Um, on the ground, I think that the main thing that you're looking for are all those signs of heat stress. Melted wires, discolored plastic, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, if you really want to be diligent, then you're going to be checking the breaker size against the, uh, uh, the equipment installed. And since EV charging is relatively new, um, I would say there's a greater chance of finding a defect. Uh, a lot of people install this stuff, they DIY it themselves, and it seems to work, and they go with it. Um, and it may never have been tested because it didn't get the proper vehicle. I'll take a quick dive through uh, IR inspection. So here are two images from the InterNACHI inspection library showing a breaker with visible light and a breaker with um, uh, an infrared camera. So if you have a camera, the EVSE, provided that it's actually under load, uh, is a great target. You can see if anything's getting warm. If you don't have an AR, IR camera or you don't consider that part of your inspections, then you're looking for heat stress on the wires. You know, are they the color that they're supposed to be? I should have a picture of that, don't. Now, let's get to an important context, uh, an important topic for electricians. For quite some time now, the National Electric Code has required the use of a torque screwdriver when securing electrical connections. This rule is pretty widely ignored, especially among experienced electricians that feel that their wrists are calibrated for torque. There have been multiple scientific studies. There have been multiple challenge exercises where experienced electricians torque down a screw, but they don't get to see the little measure about how much torque they're putting on. And it turns out they're wrong. Um, there is no evidence that humans are able to correctly torque screws. And we get away with it in most residential electric uh, circuits because they're not pulling a tremendous amount of power. But remember that we had 14 microwave ovens on the same circuit. Um, you cannot inspect torque after the fact. Torque has to be done correctly at, by the original installer. The only thing that you can do to detect that a screw was incorrectly torqued is to look for signs of heat stress. You can't bring a torque screwdriver and torque it down again because then you'd be over torquing. Um, the pictured torque screwdriver is from Weha. It's a German company. They make very nice torque screwdrivers uh, that work super well. And um, I've now encountered several city inspectors and seen reports online as well of city inspectors, when they come to an inspection, the first question they ask the electrician is, can I see your torque wrench? And the answer often is, why the heck are you asking me that question? But uh, torque wrenches are good things. And I have a little note here, uh, with great apologies to aluminum wiring, something else that we're trained to look for is solid aluminum wiring in branch circuits. And uh, there's some evidence to indicate that the real problem with aluminum wires could have been more about how they were torqued down than the actual aluminum. But that ship has sailed, hopefully. OK, I'll take another pause here uh, for any questions, as then I'll move into a new, uh, a new topic here. So the question I got was, what help does the EV owner get from the EV manufacturer or dealer in getting the right plug in his garage? Um, some new EVs come with a, basically a coupon for a local electrician to come in and install um, an EV SE for you. So that's one possible answer to that. Uh, most people just hire an electrician in order to install it. There are two options here. You either get a plug installed and then you separately choose your EV SE and plug it in, or you have it hardwired. I recommend hardwiring myself, but when we're talking about how to inspect EVSE, uh, we have to take whatever we get. So hardwiring is required above 50 amps. So if it's a 65 amp charger, it has to be hardwired. 
And below that, um, going hardwiring removes the need for a GFCI breaker in some cases. It, it ends up being pretty much cost neutral, but it means that the trade-off is that you have to bring an electrician in in order to change it. Okay. Um, I'll even expand on that just a little bit further to say that uh, most EV drivers, particularly new ones, overestimate how big or the, the ampacity of the, the maximum capacity of charger that they need. Uh, and in fact, uh, the building code in California, as the, the one that is just coming out next year, sets a minimum much lower than anybody originally thought was practical. So the minimum for uh, new apartments and multifamily is now a 20 amp charger. So 20 amp level one charger. Uh, but all the studies have shown that that takes care of some high 90s, 90% 90 of people's needs. So some people come in, they want the biggest charger they can possibly get. Uh, that's more wire, more risk, and all of that. So next question I got was how many amps is the typical dryer splitter uh, that I showed? So that's going to exactly match the dryer. If it's a 30 amp circuit, then you should be getting a 30 amp dryer splitter and limiting your EVSE to 30 amps. And as an inspector, you might want to make sure that all of those numbers match. Um, I'll see if I can pull up a NEMA chart here. It might be a little bit ugly, but uh, we will do it. Uh, it's not coming up very cleanly, but uh, there we go. So here is a set of all of the current NEMA plugs and their shape and their amperage rating. So if it's got this particular shape, it's a right. NEMA 620 R. Are you able to see this chart or not? No, we're not seeing your screen. Uh, okay, we will fix that in a moment. There we go, uh, thanks for the heads up. So these are, are, are we seeing the, the NEMA chart now? We got it, perfect. Great, exactly. So NEMA def defines a tremendous number of different plug configurations and they're all valid for EV charging. Um, there's a couple that are more common, um, but if you see this shape, you know that it's 20 amps and that's a locking one. Um, and let's see if I can find the Wikipedia version here. It's a better one. There we go. This is the nice chart. Okay, so you've got 120 volt AC, 240 volt AC. Uh, the green is ground. Uh, if you begin to recognize these shapes, then you'll instantly know what the matching breaker should be. Again, if you don't recognize it, look for heat stress. Okay. Okay, any more questions? And uh, if not, we'll move on. Okay, so uh, I promised that the webinar would talk about complex dynamic loads, and indeed EVs are a complex dynamic load. There's other tricks that you can do. For example, what if you had a house with a 60 amp main panel or a 100 amp main panel? You come along and say, I'd like to install an EV charger, and your electrician says, eh, that'll be $15,000 for a new panel. Nonsense. So it is possible now uh, and legal under the NEC to have your EV charger use only the available electricity. So this is a CT clamp. And what it does is it just clips over an electrical wire and it can measure the amount of current that's flowing through it. And if you hook that up to an EV load management system, you can put a 50 amp charger on a 60 amp 
main uh, home electrical service. Hopefully it's good for the full 60 amps because it'll use it. So what will happen is that you plug in your car and it'll start charging at, um, so let's say we put in a 50 amp breaker into our 60 amp service. So it'll start charging the car at 40 amps. And then the moment that you turn on your electric oven, it'll tell, oh, whoa, slow down car. And the car within under a second will slow down on charging and everything's gonna be just fine. And in fact, here is a set of charts that I made uh, using two wall boxes. And uh, I think I had a space heater and there's a solar system involved, that doesn't matter. And um, this blue line represents the um, load, the main panel load. So the amount of energy that was coming in from the utility. And these other colored loads represent the EV load. And so here we were humming along. The EV chargers were taking less than the maximum that the house could, uh, could take. I bumped up the EV charger. And then I turned on the vacuum and the heater. Oh my God, I have just overloaded my main panel and by a lot on purpose. So I don't have the scale here, but I was probably over by 20 or 30 amps. And the load spiked way up here. And then all of a sudden it plummets. That's because the EV load management system immediately reacted. Now, uh, electrical systems, uh, the breakers don't trip instantly when they reach their maximum. It's, there's a curve of time and amount of amperage. So if I had overloaded this circuit by 200 amps, it would have shut off immediately. But because I overloaded it only by a modest amount, uh, the electronics were able to react, uh, the cars reacted, and they dropped the charging current. It then bounced up and down a bit uh, as it tried to find a, a new happy medium. And then eventually it did. So the vacuum, the heater, and the two EVs all uh, happily coexisted on this greatly restricted uh, circuit. Now, what can you do to inspect something like this? Uh, my answer is probably nothing. It's a little bit complex, but if you're seeing something that looks like it can't possibly fit, uh, don't complain that you are overloading the electrical system if there's a load management system involved uh, that's taking care of it. So how to determine whether there's a load management system, I would say what you're looking for is CT clamps. So if there is uh, an electrical measuring device, an me electrical measuring device on the main, that might be a hint to you that there is a load management system involved. Now, that was a lot to take. Um, I will, um, I'm gonna ask for questions on that topic in just a moment. Uh, I've got a section of the 2023 NEC on EV load management. And this is the first time that they've really addressed the issue of load management systems. And their answer is, yeah, go ahead, use them uh, as long as they don't um, shed load from a fire pump or an emergency system or, uh, I don't know, somebody's medical equipment. And uh, just some good practices, they have to automatically cease current flow upon failure or malfunction. So the electronics within the load management system has to be self-aware enough that it uh, uh, it shuts down if the conditions uh, seem wrong. Okay. Okay, so the question is, where do you usually see the EVLMS attached to the main? Um, literally on the main. So you're going to come in, you're going to have your meter, and then there's going to be some distance of wire between that and all of your breakers. So the ideal place for that is between the meter and um, the service breakers. There could be a main breaker also, and the EVLMS can be either between the meter and the main or between the main breaker and the panel. And if those happen to be uh, wire connected, you are all good just put your CT clamps on them. Uh, sometimes you have a manufactured uh, panel 
where that's just some metal bars. And there's a fancier type of uh, CT clamp called a Rogowski coil, um, uh, which would be that. But you would be looking for a piece of clearly added equipment um, between the main and the service breakers. Okay, back to our presentation. Um, one issue that we have here is that a number of these, the, the manufacturers of this equipment actually involve a service contract or a subscription. And the question I asked you is, will that company be around in five years? Um, a lot of the stuff is fairly new. A lot of the companies are startups. Most startup companies fail. So that's an issue also. The NEC is just starting to deal with that question of uh, what do you do with obsolete equipment? Again, I think this is out of scope for a home inspector. Okay, so that's the bulk of the EVSE itself. And here's a little charge chart that explains why the time of day stuff is so important in EV charging. So each one of these lines is the load on the California electric grid. And as each year goes on, in 2012, that curve kind of bounced around and then bumped up a little in the evening. And each year thereafter, the down goes further and the up goes higher. And by 2020, 2020, 2020, they're worried that there is more energy being generated in California than is being consumed during the middle of the day. And this is a result of California going with so much solar energy. So essentially, you've got overproduction of solar energy during the middle of the day. And then as the sun goes down and people get home and turn on their electric stoves, there's a rapid, rapid ramp. And any place that's got uh, solar is going to have a similar problem with this. So they need to ramp by 13,000 megawatt hours in just three hours. So that's a tremendous stress on the grid. And that's one of the reasons that um, computers are being used to determine when EVs charge. Uh, here's another curve that shows the same thing. So the total in January and February is that you've got this bump of solar in the middle and natural gas dips to match. But in July and August, uh, you've got, uh, you've got a, a very unbalanced grid curve. And the hope is that electric vehicles can be used to smooth out the grid by um, adjusting the charging times. Okay. Moving to the next topic. So these are the winter essentials. If you've got an EV, you should always bring your starting fluid and your oil pan heater. No, wait a minute. I must have mislabeled this. That's for your gas cars. So for electric vehicles, uh, you need nothing special in cold weather. Uh, I'm up at 7,000 feet in the Sierras right now. Uh, no worries at all about having an EV. It's going to start in the morning. Um, I can just drive it. Uh, it is possible that when the batteries are cold, that I will be limited in top speed until they warm up. Not that different than the gas engine. Uh, you may have heard the issues in Chicago with uh, ultra low temperatures. Uh, those EV drivers largely had empty batteries and tried to fast charge them in negative 30 weather. And the issue is that that takes a while. So when you plug in the EVSE, um, it's going to spend the first amount of time, in that particular case, it was about 20 minutes, warming up the battery before it really gets going on charging. So those people would have been fine if they had home charged or had been more patient. Uh, some of them reported on the news that they uh, plugged in and got nothing after 20 minutes and then drove to another station and plugged in and got nothing after 20 minutes and drove to a third station. Uh, well, that's a good way to ensure that your battery isn't particularly warm. So EVs, not a big problem in winter, just you need kind of different stuff than the old uh, jump-starty fluid. Next topic. Um, the, this is really odd. Uh, just so you know, the uh, cable used for EV charging and the plug on cars is going to change. This is brand new, just happened in a complete sudden motion. Uh, starting uh, early last year, and it's already been standardized. So everyone's decided to go with a Tesla's connector. And it's got some advantages, um, in particular, a really big one that hasn't got a lot of press, is it will allow charging at up to 270 volts, which is a really good match for commercial power. 
So with the old standard, you had to have a step-down transformer in order to run the EVSE, which just adds complexity and cost. Okay, there's lots of other electrical uh, topics that we could go into for a, a future webinar, modular EV batteries, home DC fast charging. Uh, but again, let's get to you inspecting the uh, regular EVs first. So my big takeaways for you, maximum load is 80% of the breaker rating. The label on the EVSC may not be the actual max load and different cars will pull different amounts of current. And loose connections and heat are the enemy a uh, little bear's torque is what I say. So those connections need to be torqued, not too much, not too little. And the best way to do that is with a torque wrench. You as an inspector are going to be looking for heat stress to indicate when that didn't happen properly. A diligent regular inspection is all you need for EVSEs. Look for discolored wires, melted plastic, and unprofessional work as an indication that perhaps somebody wasn't all that careful. If you want to dive in more, or more importantly, if your electrician wants to dive in more, they can take EVTIP training. It's Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program. It's a 20-hour online course on all of these details. Hopefully they do and get it right, and your inspections will clear the EV charger uh, for its next use. Well, great. Um, I guess I just want to say don't be scared if you see an EVSE. I think it's safer for you to inspect it. Um, uh, than to not inspect it and disclaim it. Uh, there are there there are a lot of them that aren't installed right. Um, yeah, please check. Have a great day, everybody. And uh, I'll uh, send out those extra materials and uh, you can take a crack at those quizzes. Maybe it'll show up in one of those InterNACHI uh, weekly quizzes sometime soon. Good day.